We are studying tonight concerning two kings who reign at the same time, one Jeroboam II reigning, of course, in the nation of Israel, and looking at Uzziah, who reigned in the nation of Judah. And the period of these two kings, as we see here, they do coincide pretty much with uh, as of I, which of course Kings refers to him as, Second Chronicles refers to him as Uzziah, and also Jeroboam the second. We of course recall that the very first king that Judah or that Israel had was Jeroboam, and that of course is not this Jeroboam that we'll be studying about this evening. The period of these two kings can somewhat be described as a breather, uh, a respite, I guess is another word, from war and destruction. But that's not to say that it is a period in either nation that was without its problems. Both of these were successful kings, in a manner of speaking. Jeroboam the second is the minor of these two that we're going to be studying. Uh, but yet the thing that we see that stands out about him is that he was obviously a very skilled leader of the military. And the main character that we'll be looking at in this study, as I've said, is by two names. And I've said in the beginning of our study of the divided kingdom that this is one of the things that makes a study of divided kingdom a little difficult to have either kings that are of the same name or a king that has more than one name. So like I've said, in the book of Kings, Second Kings, he is referred to as Azariah in Second Chronicles, where we'll be doing most of our study, he is referred to as Uzziah. But Uzziah, though he was a good king, he had a bad ending, as we'll be seeing. And the things that Uzziah did helps to teach us valuable lessons about profaning or disrespecting things that need to be held sacred. So looking at Jeroboam, again, this is Jeroboam II, from what 2 Kings 14 we just have what is recorded basically in verses 23 to 29 that we find out about him. He's the fourth king of Israel after Jehu, Hazor, uh, and Jehoash. But he's the 14th king since the beginning of the nation of Israel. He reigns for 41 years in Israel, in the capital, Samaria. And, as we said, very little is given, very little, therefore, is known about him, except that he did conquer territory that was lost to Syria and to some other kings of the north of the nation of Israel. He conquered, in fact, north to Hamath and to Damascus, and he finally did conquer Syria, which brought an end to an ongoing battle that had been fought for about 100 years. And it is believed that the northern borders of Israel now reach what was originally conquered by David. And that we go back and find in First Kings chapter 4 and verse 21, although what Jeroboam II conquered, Israel only retained possession of it for just a very short period of time, some 30, uh, maybe 40 years. Jeroboam II's success was not a reward for any good he had done. And I think that's what we see in those seven verses there in 2 Kings 14. 
the respite or this, as we said a moment ago, this uh, cease of conflict during this period of time was God's mercy on his people. But as for Jeroboam himself, he continued to worship the golden calves as every king of Israel had done ever since Jeroboam the first built the calves and put them in for the nation of Israel to worship. Looking now at Uzziah or uh, Ahazra, the son of Amaziah. This we now look in chapter 15. And it's in the first seven verses there that we find that Uzziah was a king of Judah and his story is very brief as far as what we have recorded in 2 Kings 15. He is the tenth king of Judah. So that's not on your papers, but if you want to make a notation of it, um, Jeroboam II was the 14th king of Israel and Uzziah is the 10th king since the beginning of the nation of Judah. It's interesting that the name Uzziah means my strength is from Jehovah. Uh, quite often times names that we read about in the scriptures have a meaning. And this, I thought, was interesting uh, concerning Uzziah's name. He did what was right in the eyes, eyes of the Lord, as these verses in Second Kings says. Yet still he practiced idolatry, he, and that continued in the nation of Judah. The worship that took place in the high places, the burning of incense to the idols, this was something that continued. And really we're not told in 2 Kings why he was struck with leprosy. But when we read chapter 26 in 2 Chronicles, then there we have a much more, a better, more detailed account. So, looking at 2 Chronicles 26, what we find in those first six verses is that Uzziah began to reign when he was 16 years old, when his father, of course, was in disgrace. And we studied about him in our study last Wednesday night. He rebuilt the city of Elis, which, if you look at on a map, it opened to the Red Sea. And it thus allowed shipping to and from the east. And we know that shipping from the east usually amounted to India, China, and the places like that, even in the early settlement of our country. Uh, it was very important to receive uh, shipments from the east, from these countries. <laughs> and and if, you look at, if you look at stuff we buy today, it's still, made in China, so we still look in that direction for many of our products. But that to say, he set himself to seek God. And Zechariah, and don't mistake this Zechariah for the Zechariah that we have later on in the Old Testament that wrote, who was a prophet and wrote the book of Zechariah because the time period don't match at all. From what we're studying here concerning Uzziah, and then we read about the prophet that we're most familiar with, Zechariah, we're talking about 200, about 200 years. So this Zechariah is not the writing prophet, nor the son of Jehoiada. We've already been introduced to a Zechariah before, so this is not unusual to see in different periods, those that have similar or same names. And that we read in 2 Chronicles 24. But Zechariah was a mentor, we might say, to Uzziah. He taught Uzziah 
the fear of the Lord. And another point is that it's interesting that a great earthquake which occurred during Uzziah's reign is not mentioned, either in the account of Second Kings or the account of Second Chronicles. But we find that Amos, one of the minor prophets, uses it as a time marker in Amos 1 and verse 1. And we also remember 200 years later that the Zechariah that we're most familiar with, he makes mention of it in Zechariah chapter 14 and verse 5. In verses, really verses 7 through 15, what we have in these verses is a record of Uzziah's success. He put down Judah's enemies, which one of the more familiar ones, the Philistines, they always seem to be a nation that pops up in, throughout the, the Old Testament. But in addition to the Philistines, it was the Ammonites, and there was one that we've really not been introduced to or read that much of, either before or since, is the Midianites and the Arabs. We find that uh, Uzziah had success in putting the enemies of Judah down. He built up the defenses of Jerusalem, and he invented what apparently was the catapult which was a, a military device that could shoot both arrows as well as stones. And it's interesting that catapults are not really recorded in history until about 400 BC. But we know that Uzziah, he lived around 750. So whether it was the finished product or just a vague resemblance of what was later become to be the catapult. Uh, still, it makes for some interesting reading what we had there in Second Chronicles 26. He had a standing army of some 307,000. And he had 2,600 leaders of the armies. And these armies were well equipped. But in addition to the military and the defense aspects of what Uzziah is made mention of in these verses, he cultivated the land. He dug wells for water in the deserts. He had great herds, and he employed farmers. He employed vine dressers. And so in all of this, we see that God prospered him. He was strong, he was very strong, and he was well known uh, throughout the land. So when we're talking about Uzziah, at least in what we've read so far in these 15 verses of Second Chronicles, we see a great success story. But it should have ended here, but it doesn't. It's in verses 16 through 23 of this 26th chapter that despite Uzziah being brought up in the fear of God, he tried to take on the role of a priest. He was caught in the holy place at the altar of incense. And he was burning incense, which was purely a duty that belonged only to the priest. Eighty valiant men who were priests were sent in to show him the door, I guess is the best way to put it. And that's what they did. And what this amounts to is he has trespassed. 
He has trespassed into the holy place. Remember, there was the outer court, I believe the tabernacle or the, the temple. And then there was the holy place, which only the priest could enter. And then there was the most holy, or the holiest of holies, where only the high priest could enter. But Uzziah has found himself in to the holy place. And not just the fact that his presence is there, when it ought not to even be there, he is there offering incense, which is truly something that's out of place. So, you know, you can ask a lot of questions. <laughs> a lot of ideas may come into the mind. It's why, it's why is he doing this? You know, was he intending to worship God in a special way? Was God his focus in all of this? Or maybe did he think he was entitled to be a priest as well as a king? You know, only Jesus has those two titles. Was he trying to break the authority of the priest to bring about a change in worship to God? You know, we can go on and on trying to figure why Uzziah does this. But whether it's any one of these three or any one of a half a dozen others, none of them justifies what he did. Whatever his intention, whatever his motive, whatever prompted him to do this, there's no reason, much less excuse, that justifies what he's done. Purely, he has transgressed. In fact, the priest said there in verse 18, you shall have no honor from the Lord God. So that's what has been pronounced upon Uzziah as a result of this action that he's taken. Well, when they say that, he becomes furious. And it was then that leprosy broke out. Leprosy that broke out on his forehead. Now, whether the leprosy was whole body and all the way to the top of his head, I really don't know that we can determine to the extent. But the point is this, that when the leprosy breaks out on him, he runs out of the temple. And because of his leprosy, he stays in an isolated house. In other words, he quarantined, which is what lepers were required to do in that day and time for the rest of his life. So, this is something that he can hide. Like I said, we don't know to the extent of the leprosy, how much it covered his body, but one thing about it, if, it, if the leprosy was on his arms or if the leprosy was on his legs or anywhere on his main body frame, it, it could be hidden. But see, this leprosy is on his forehead. No hiding that. So that's why I'm saying, I don't know if it was just the forehead or if it was over the entire body, but there was no way he could hide it. It was obvious to anyone that saw him. And the kingdom was given over to his son, Jotham. And here's what we read concerning the end of Josiah. They buried him with his fathers in the field a burial, which belonged to the kings, for they said he is a leper. See, he was buried in the field. He was buried in the cemetery, not in the tombs of the kings. And we've heard and studied in reference to many of these kings of Judah that many of them, most of them, were were buried in the tomb of the kings, with the exception, and here's another, 
exception. He was buried in the field of burial because of his leprosy. Just to sort of do a little thinking about Uzziah, Uzziah is the third of three kings of Judah with a similar story. And what I mean by similar is he had a good start, but he didn't end so well. Joash, if you remember, he did well as long as Jehoiada was alive. Because Jehoiada seemed to have influence on Joash. But then when Jehoiada died, then Joash, as we see later in life, he succumbed to idolatry by the princes and he was assassinated by his very own servants. Another king that was like Uzziah was his father. We studied last week. Amaziah, he was subject to the law of the Lord, and he was successful until he conquered the Edomites. And remember what he brought back with him. He brought back the idols of Edom. And he worshipped them, and Judah worshipped them as well. And we know that he was condemned for this action, by a prophet of God. And we see that in being lifted up because of his victory over Edom, pride led him to even attack Israel. And that, of course, was to his disgrace because Israel defeated him and Judah. And again, he was assassinated by his own people. And then, of course, is Uzziah. He'd done good under Zachariah's instructions until his pride drove him into sin. And as we've seen, he dies in isolation as a leper. Another observation about Uzziah is that he trespassed into for the lack of a better word, sacred space. And by that, by that I mean the holy place. And not only that, he trespassed in the duties of a sacred office, the office of priest. And when you think about that, there are several other examples in the Old Testament of these types of trespassers into sacred places, into sacred uh, offices. And we see some severe consequences. Take, take, for example, back in Exodus 19. At Mount Sinai, no one, none of the children of Israel were permitted to go up the mountain or even to touch the border of the mountain without the penalty, the consequence of being put to death. Sacred place, sacred territory. Don't trespass. If you do, you die. Then there's a story that surely we're familiar with in Leviticus 10, and that's the sons of Aaron, Nadab and Abihu. They were priests. They were offering sacrifices. They were burning incense. But God specified from where the fire was to be taken. And what we read in Leviticus 10 is that they took their censers, both of these priests, and they burned incense, but they did so with what the Bible calls profane. And that word profane just simply means no respect. You know, in the New Testament, an individual that's referred to as a profane individual was Esau. And Esau didn't curse. Esau 
Esau didn't commit adultery. Esau didn't do none of that. But what did he do? He took that which was sacred and sold it for a bowl of stew. And he's referred to as a do not be profane, who is Esau, who sold his birthright for a bowl of porridge. Then there is Miriam and Aaron, the brothers and sisters of, of Moses. And here's what we read about them, if in case we've let it slip our minds. They challenged Moses' leadership. And here's what they said. Has the Lord spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? And with that, God came before the three in the pillar of cloud, and here's what God said. With him, referring to Moses, I speak mouth to mouth, clearly, and not in dark speech. And he beholds the form of the Lord. And then he asked, why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? And with that, when the cloud disappeared, Miriam was leprous. And Aaron and Moses pleaded for her healing. So here we see something that God had done, and that is put the leadership into the hands of Moses. And here is Miriam and Aaron challenging that leadership. Also remember, hopefully, Korah, Dathan, and the Bible. They confronted Moses, Moses and Aaron. And they made the statement, and this is all in Numbers chapter 16, you have gone too far for all of the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Why did you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? Again, a challenge to the authority of Moses and Aaron. And of course, Got to keep in mind that Korah was a Levite, just as Aaron was a Levite. And you got to keep in mind, too, that this rebellion involved some 250. All of them were carrying censers of incense in this rebellion, and they all died. Again, they are intruding. They are trespassing into that which God has designated. And not only that, but when these 250 men die, then there's an, a larger rebellion that breaks out. And here there is 14,700 that die of a plague. Again, all because of trespassing contrary to the things that God had demanded, the way the things that God had demanded to be. David, you remember there were many occasions when we studied David that he had occasion to kill Saul. And because Saul was always in pursuit of him. Saul was doing everything that he could to kill David, and David had many opportunities, at least two, primarily, that, he, that Saul was in his hands. He could have killed him. But David refused to even touch Saul, and the statement that he makes in 1 Samuel 26 is because he is the Lord's anointed. David knew what it would mean for him to kill Saul, and he doesn't. And here's a man that I hope that we're not confusing <laughs> with the king that we're studying, Uzzah. Uzzah and Uzziah, <laughs> just, uh, just a very a little bit of difference, uh, leaving off of the eye between these two names, but we're familiar with Uzzah. He touched the ark when David was trying to 
bring it out of the house of Abinadad when the Philistines had captured it many years earlier and bring it back to Jerusalem. But we know that the oxen on which they were transporting the ark of the covenant, which was not the proper means of transporting it, the oxen stumble. It appears that the ark, the most sacred piece of furniture that was in the tabernacle or the temple, was about to suffer damage. And and Ezra put forth his hand. And what happens? He is struck dead. And of course, going all the way back to Jeroboam, remember he made, in addition to the two calves, he made an altar in Bethel. And that altar split apart when a young prophet rebuked it. And Jeroboam the first lost the use of his arm when he attempted to have the prophet arrested. So there are all kinds of examples in the Old Testament of similar trespasses, just like what we're reading of Uzziah. In the New Testament, Christ makes a drastic change in worship. He said to the woman at the well in John 4, that neither on this mountain, and that would be referring to Mount Jerusalem, which was the mountain on which the Samaritans worship, nor in Jerusalem shall you worship the Father. But the hour is coming and now is when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. We know that when Jesus died, there was a great earthquake so great that even the veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom, as Matthew records. And that was what the Hebrew writer talks about in Hebrews 10, verse 20, where is now, through the veil, through his flesh, Christ has passed. He's passed into the heavens, which the heaven, heaven is to us the holiest of holies. We're in the holy place, we're in the church, but we're looking for the holiest of holies. And Christ has made entrance into that through the flesh when he suffered and died upon the cross. So there was a statement, too, that Paul made in 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 16. Do you not know that you are God's temple? and that God's spirit dwells in you. So see, well, let's just add Peter to that. First Peter 2 and verse 9 of Christians, Peter says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people. So in the New Testament, the believer, the Christian, is the temple. The Christian is the priest. And there has been a change, we see, from the physical, the tabernacle or the temple that was built, the priest, the sons of Levi, the altars, the sacred furniture that we read about in the Old Testament, the sacrifices, the incense, the holy days, and on and on and on. All of this we see concerning worship under the Old Testament. But now we see that the emphasis had changed. It changed from the physical to the spiritual. We still offer up sacrifices, right? But Peter says we offer up spiritual sacrifices in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5. So, time is running out. It's person that did what Uzziah did as you were going through that not to take steal your time uh, Simon the sorcerer said give me this power mm-hmm. and it's often pointed out where he you know Peter said you thought you could buy it but Peter also said this is none of your business you have neither heart nor lot like he was entering into an area Definitely. that he wasn't authorized to. Definitely. 
most, and that's a good, good one to put in with the others that we've seen, how important it is that we don't intrude. When we look at lessons, you know, now we know there is no sacred place to violate. There is no sacred office to intrude in as Urza. Uh, Uzziah did. We are getting confused now. We are the temple of the living God. And Christ, first bell, first thank you. And Christ alone is our master. Now, how might we intrude? You know, when you think about it, most of our sins are sins of omission. And what I mean by that is failure to do. We don't pray as we should. We don't evangelize as we should. We don't read. We don't study the scriptures as we should. We don't love our neighbors as ourselves. Usually our sins fall more likely than not in things that we should be doing that we're not doing. But what is sin? Well, Romans 3, 23, all of sin to come short of the glory of God. Sin is to come short. That's what sin is. And in 1 John 3 and verse 4, whosoever committed sin transgresses the law, of the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. 1 John 3, 4. Sin is transgression, as the King James refers to it. The New King James says lawlessness. So transgression is going beyond like what we have mentioned in 3 John 9. Whosoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. So sin occurs when a person does not abide in. And then in Romans 14, verse 23, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. And we know John 17, 17, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So examples of profaning or desecrating are really many. When it comes to our bodies, which we have shown already to be the temple of the Holy Spirit. Fornication. You know, you go over to 1 Corinthians 6 and read, starting at verse 12, all the way through verse 20, and you see that fornication is desecrating, profaning the temple. It's our body that we have profaning, but our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And when you think about it, just as a Christian, when we fall away, when we're no longer faithful, we use the word apostasy a lot, but when we as a Christian, we fall away. Remember what the Hebrew, uh, the Hebrew writer said in Hebrews 6 and verse 6? He said, we crucify again the Son of God. And we put him to an open shame. That's what we do when we as a Christian don't remain faithful, don't remain true, don't remain in fidelity with our Lord. So, I think the time's about up. There's some additional lessons, and if you have the papers, you, you've got them. But I, I would like to go over them uh, because they're, they're major. They have to do everything with us maintaining a right relationship with God, and they have everything to do with something that is sometimes so easy for us to succumb to, and that is pride, just like we see with uh, Uzziah. So let's just mark our places here, Roman numeral 8, and I'll still be getting the next study, which um,